Hey, my name is Josh Korak. I'm a mental health counselor in the Northern Colorado area. In this space, I get the chance to interview professionals in the field, talk about mental illness, self-care, and so much more. With this show, I ask you to join me in doing what one of my favorite philosophers, a Buddhist monk, Thich Nhat Hanh says, smile, breathe, and go slowly. This is Care with Korak. Hey, hey, everyone. Welcome back to Care with Korak. This is Josh. I'm really glad to have you here. Um, today, we have just yet another uh, amazing guest, Dr. Catherine Ramsland. I'm excited to share a little bit more about her in a second. Uh, I do have to kind of preface and apologize for this episode because I was in the process of losing my voice uh, while recording, and so it is not uh, my peak voice level, and so I just ask you to bear with me and um, hang in there for the episode. It's really good, some really insightful stuff from Dr. Ramsland, and really interesting um, as well, and so... I hope it is still just as enjoyable and insightful as the rest of my episodes. A little bit about Dr. Catherine Ramsland. Dr. Ramsland teaches forensic psychology at DeSalle's University in Pennsylvania, where she is the assistant provost. She has appeared as an expert in criminal psychology on more than 200 crime documentaries and magazine shows, is an executive producer of Murder House Flip, and has consulted for CSI, Bones, and The Alienist. Dr. Ramsland is the author of more than 1,500 articles and 69 books. Don't worry, we're going to get into that. Uh, Including The Forensic Science of CSI, The Forensic Psychology of Criminal Minds, How to Catch a Killer, The Psychology of Death Investigations, and Confession of a Serial Killer, The Untold Story of Dennis Rader, The BTK Killer. She was also the co-executive producer for the Wolf Entertainment A&E four-part documentary based on the years she spent talking with Raider. Dr. Ramsland spent five years talking and spending time with uh, Dennis Raider, and we're spending a lot of time in this episode talking about that. Dr. Ramsland consults on multiple death investigations. She pens a blog for Psychology Today, which I linked in my episode description, and is currently writing a fiction series based on a female forensic psychologist who manages a private investigation agency. So if you're interested in reading one of her many books, um, I have linked that as well uh, in the episode description below. In this episode, Dr. Ramsland and I discuss her work with the BTK killer, Dennis Rader, what we can learn from serial killers and her work with them, and then the rise of true crime and pop culture and what that actually means, uh, and so much more. For more information, access to her books and her Psychology Today blog, make sure to check out her link. Uh, follow me on TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, social media, wherever, for video clips, podcast previews, and more mental health content. All right, well, let's not waste any more time and let's get into it. This is Care with Korak with Dr. Katherine Ramsland. Well, I mean, cool. It's, it's nice to finally meet you. Yep. I appreciate you taking some time out of your, what I assume is a very busy schedule, and so I, I appreciate your time. You're welcome. It's, it's advising week, so yeah, I had to run out of my office quick to get to do this <laughs> oh no yeah what's what's advising week what is that um students figuring out what they want to do for next semester for the rest of their lives <laughs> <laughs> you know small things right <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah well awesome well why don't we just start off by you just kind of introducing yourself maybe sharing a little bit back about your background and your story and just kind of where you're at now with life Okay, are we are we just right? So I have a lot of podcast requests. Is this about BTK or writing or what are we? What is this? What is um, your a little bit, thing? a little bit of everything. Just mental health oriented. So you know, kind of yeah, talking about okay. the BTK killer, I think would be really fascinating. Um, just your books in general, 
Um, oh, right. This is the mental health one. Sorry. Right. That's no, right. that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe eventually um, look at it. And should I look like I'm looking at a camera right now? Is this good? Yep. yep. No, that's perfect. Looking at the camera? Okay. Yep. Yep. That's okay. perfect. Okay. Yeah. So, so why so don't we just I'm start off Dr. with a little introduction? Ka- yeah. Okay. I'm Dr. Catherine Ramsland. I'm an assistant provost at DeSales University, where I teach forensic psychology courses, several different types, at the undergraduate and graduate level. I'm the author of, so far, 69 books, wow. uh, thousands <laughs> of articles, and I ha- am the executive producer of several shows, including Murder House Flip, and also I executive produced the four-part A&E documentary on the BTK serial killer called Confession of a Serial Killer, based on five years of work with him. Yeah, that's so, I mean, the the thing that stands out to me is 69 books published. That's a lot of books. That's very impressive. Yeah. I have three yeah. more coming, maybe four. Oh, okay. Any Any hints at what they're about? Um, well, I started, so I've been writing over 30 years, 35 years. Um, I started out writing a book based on my dissertation in philosophy, mm. which was using something from Kierkegaard in psychotherapy, because I also had kind of a double major in psychology at the time. I was teaching philosophy at Rutgers University. Um, I thought I would never want to write another book because I really hated writing academic books. Interesting, <laughs> just, yeah. <laughs> but then I wrote Anne Rice's biography, and then I didn't want to do anything else but write. So wow. the difference between a commercial book and a academic book um, was vast. Oh, I'm in terms sure. terms of the experience of writing and creating. Mm, yeah. So that's how I started it, and then I went on to do Um, Lots of other different types of books. Some of them Mm -hmm. were immersion journalism, where I went undercover in the vampire subculture. Wow. I went uh, into the ghost hunting subculture, which was really fun, staying in all kinds of haunted places. Um, And then I ended up really concentrating probably the last 25 years in forensics, Mm -hmm. specifically extreme offenders, mass murderers, serial killers, forensic psychology, which is what I teach now, and mm-hmm. um, some forensic science. So most of the work I do now is all about that. Wow. That's that's amazing. I mean, how did you even get into some of these? I mean, you're, you're working on TV shows, you're writing tons of books and articles, you're working with serial killers. Like, how did you even get here? Circuitously. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I can imagine. <laughs> Always open to an adventure. Writing seems to be my medium of learning, and I love to learn. And I especially love to learn through research and expression. But it, but I don't like teaching as much as writing. So for me, it's really about learning it and then putting it through my fingers to words and publications mm-hmm. So I do write pretty obsessively. I write all the time, every day. Um, and I, I love it. I, just, I haven't gotten tired of it yet. So yeah. that's, that's great. And if, you, if you're if you a writer, have the ability to move around in a lot of different venues. You can, as long as you're willing to learn about it um, and you keep your skills honed, I think that there's a lot you can do as a writer. And I, mm-hmm. I certainly know there were ways I got into things that most people couldn't get into because I had those connections. So many of the, much of my forensic opportunities, like being on an exhumation team, for example, which was a blast, wow, was because I could write the book about it mm. or interviewing FBI profilers because I could help write their books. Um, so writing is really a an entree into many mm. places that, You know, I ordinarily wouldn't get into because I wouldn't have had the credentials, but the writing helps me, you know, have it have ways in for other people and then they're Mm. willing to work with me. Yeah. Wow. What a cool, you know, something they can take is is even just a hobby and you can turn that into such a huge um, professional development tool. 
Yeah, I'd, I've never thought of it as a hobby. It's always been the other job, and sometimes mm, okay. the only job. Because there, there have been times I taught at Rutgers, then I quit. Um, that was in philosophy. Now I'm a, a psychology professor. But there were years in between those that uh, I was just freelance writing. Wow. So I've never thought of it as a hobby at all. It, okay. It, 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 I put as least as much into it as I put into my job. Wow. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Um, what made you kind of want to work in, in this specific subfield of psychology? I mean, you're, you're talking about vampires, ghost hunting, serial killers. Like, that's some pretty intense stuff. What, what made you kind of go down that route? Or did it well, kind of just open up for you? I mean, the, the paranormal things are more just writing opportunities. Um, in terms of psychology... Uh, I just decided I wanted to get a degree in forensic psychology <laughs> because I was writing for the Court TV website, and I thought that would be a great degree to have. I didn't realize it was going to change my entire life, which it right. did. But I, got, I went to John Jay College of Criminal Justice, which is right now the number one school really in the world for this stuff, and learned a lot, was able to apply it. Uh, and, and along the way, I ended up being kind of a media spokesperson and I was writing for the court TV's website so I was constantly writing about serial killers and mass murderers so I became an expert without without really aiming for wow. that um, so so I think it really ha- had to do with I had been a therapist for a couple of years I didn't really <laughs> I wasn't very good at it because you know, people keep coming with the same stuff. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I think I just really like the more extreme types of experiences that, that come with, you know, being victims of crime, being perpetrators of crime. Um, how does a person grow up to become a serial killer? I think, right. I think my interest clinically lies with trying to discover and and uncover sort of the elusive factors when people say we just don't understand them well yeah you know what we do I do I Mm. understand them I've been immersed in hundreds of stories of people who became serial killers I do understand and I think because it's kind of a mysterious dark field it intrigued me more to get involved with it Yeah. and because of that I then can also talk with them about maybe their own struggles with trying to understand why they became this way. And, um, you know, usually they're incarcerated. I don't, <laughs> I don't, don't do any counseling of serial killers <laughs> out in the wild. Nothing no like outpatient? That. But I definitely will speak. <laughs> you know, there is somebody in Russia, in the Ukraine, who, who used to do that years ago. Oh, wow. Um, he gave them confidentiality because he thought treating them was better than them not having any access. But I'm not to that point. And I'm not really even, I don't have a license to practice clinical psychology. I've done psychotherapy. Mm-hmm. Um, but, I, but I do enjoy uh, being kind of the guide for them through their trying to figure out the factors in in their development Um, because I think not everybody could do that in part because of the things that they have done to people but also because I've seen so many cases that I can bring my knowledge to the the therapeutic arena in a way that I, I think many people would not be able to do yeah yeah I mean that's to me that's just amazing I I, I don't even know where to start with asking about some of this stuff. Like, what were there ever any? Oh, excuse me, forgot to silence my notifications. Um, yeah, I don't even know where to begin with some of this. Like, how how do you even start to approach like doing a case with a serial killer? Like, what's your first? What walk me through the process of like going to meet them the, for the first time, and then what happens afterwards? Well, one of one of the advantages I had, and I have five masters, deg- I have five graduate degrees, four of which are masters. One of those masters was in phenomenological psychology. That I was saw at that. Duquesne was, University. <laughs> that was so impressive. I love it because <laughs> it's all about bracketing your your preconceptions, putting that aside, so that you let 
whoever they are come to the fore and speak for themselves. So they taught us a lot about non-judgmental listening in, wow. in a way that you, it's not really quite the same as what you would normally get in a training for being a therapist because it's really wiping out your sense of reality and allowing their sense of reality to be expressed. So that, I think that was very helpful for, so what I would do for, with example, um, Dennis Rader, the BTK killer, the opportunity presented itself because someone else had kind of started the ball rolling and then didn't want to do this. So I had to basically ask him, how did he want to proceed? And he wanted me to solve a series of codes before he would work with me. This, and that's this was behavior. the killer who wanted. That's really interesting behavior. It's unusual. I'm, I'm all in. I want to yeah. solve the codes, not just because I want to get into this thing with him, but I want to see the codes he makes, how he responds to my um, you know, maybe not being able to figure it out or being able to figure it out. We also began to play games of chess through the mail at the same time. I didn't care who won or lost. I cared about how he responded. So it was a really interesting uh, way of watching someone's, not just what they say, um, and this is something I learned from, from Kierkegaard, my, my philosophical mentor, not just what they say, but how they relate to what they say. So the how and the what are two aspects of who they are. So you, you're really doing a deep dive into this person's life um, past their narrative into where that narrative came from and what's inconsistent or contradictory about that narrative and when are they manipulating or doing you know spin doctoring when are they um, blanking out or or not telling you details when they've been very detailed before so you're looking at a lot of different aspects of the communication process so we were on the phone. I, I went to the prison. He wrote a lot of letters, long letters. But his letters were, were the entire page filled out and then writing up the side and up the top, you know, with little pictures and stuff. So I could see that he had a, a form of hypergraphia. And hypergraphia is a symptom of some other things. So, so for me, it was this multi-layered experience of watching not just a serial killer who is looking to me to guide our journey, but also a serial killer who is expressing himself in a number of different ways, including sometimes anger, because he would, he would not like some of my questions or some of my confrontations. Um, but it was great. And then he hit on the idea of we would watch television programs because they were great ways to code what we were saying, because he wanted to always keep this layer of codes going because that's what he liked. He thought of himself as a spy and he liked to keep things hidden. Wow. And so we would watch things like um, the Americans, which was about spies embedded in, in the country during the Reagan years and lots of metaphors there. The Walking Dead, Breaking Bad, uh, Bates Motel was mm. another one. So using these, um, was really in, uh, instructive to me because, first of all, he's picking the shows. And secondly, he's making comments on scenes. Um, he even sometimes got outraged by some of the violent scenes. Even even when we wow. started playing chess, he said, you know, don't cheat. And I <laughs> what? <laughs> You're a serial killer. You've already yeah. crossed the line morally. How, mm. how are you telling me not to cheat? So what would be so wrong those with kinds of when interesting you've so behaviors. Many people. But he, but it mattered to him. Yeah, he, he needed yeah. to trust me, and it was <laughs> so. As as silly as that might sound, it was it was so rich. The behavioral aspect of this was so rich, um, and it, we spent five years. This is a deep immersion into his life um, and his sense of himself and why he killed people. And you often, when, often when you talk to serial killers, they just want to blather on and on about themselves. They're not that interested or they're very limited in how much insight they have. But the ones who really have insight and really want to explore 
and are willing to answer structured interview questions, for example, you know, they're, they're fascinating. And they, they may not be able to have that self-awareness very deeply, but they're at least trying. And they do, they do try reading hard um, texts and, and things. So watching him do this was itself a fascinating process. Oh, yeah. I mean, I can only imagine how, I mean, you spent five years with him. I mean, you, you probably got to know him pretty yeah. well. <laughs> and yeah, I, now it's been, uh, it's been 11 years since we first started. Yeah. Wow. So are you... I, I would I'm say I probably f- know him about as well as anybody. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Hey. No, no, no. Sorry. There's, there's a little bit of delay. Um, I'm, I'm not super familiar with his, his current case. Is he still alive? Is, are you still in contact well, with he, him? Well, yeah, he's, he's alive. He, he, was, he murdered 10 people in Wichita starting in 1974. He got away with it for 30 years. And then he started communicating um, with the police as like sort of a cat and mouse game. Wow. And that got him caught. So, uh, so he's an interesting serial killer from the 70s and 80s, and he currently is alive and in prison today. Wow. So do you guys still stay connected at all? Do you guys still have any communication or after the five years, was it done? No, we're, we still talk. In fact, after the five years, then there was a year before the book was published. So then he, we talked, then it was a paperback, then it was um, the, the show. So I did more interviews with mm-hmm. him for the A&E special. I mean, it's a four part that you... Authors don't often get a four-part documentary, but it was intense and involved with, you know, hundreds of hours of work. But, you know, he was right back in answering the same questions for the the television documentary. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so we really only ended maybe in January when the show aired. We still talk. I talked to him last week. I'll talk to him again soon. Um, but it's not as intense as it used to be. Mm. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm trying to like visualize a little bit some of the work you do. I, the only crime kind of serial killer esque thing that I've I've seen is Mindhunter. How does your work compare to that, or is that just completely different, completely the same? Well, my all right. We, we, it's hard for me to talk about Mindhunter since I. I know that there's so many errors in it, Is so there? many errors yeah. in it. <laughs> it bothers me. Um, I, I've worked with Douglas and Ressler, who are the two former FBI profilers yeah. um, who were featured in that. And the show makes it look as if they started the unit. They didn't. Hmm. Um, it was actually two other people who started the unit years before. Ressler was third one in, um, but... The show makes it look like they're the guys who did it. Mm. And uh, but my my issues aside, um, the idea of the prison interview program that they started doing, um, they came up with because they were traveling, they were on the road teaching. They came up with this idea of um, why don't we interview some of these offenders and start creating a database? And this is even before the FBI gets its big mainframe computer to even keep track of wow. any of this stuff. Yeah. But this is their goal. This is their aim. And so, you know, what they came out with, they, they aimed to do 100. They only got 25 who are actual serial killers. So it's a very small sample, unrepresentative. Um, and also they kind of handpicked people who could talk to them in some articulate manner if they were psychotic individuals you know that wasn't going to work so some of the claims they made as a result unfortunately have gotten into the popular culture as Mm -hmm. as fact when it's they're not facts so i know when i teach my course on serial killers or profiling i have to i have to start dismantling notions that are not correct about that population of offender. Um, but, but nevertheless, the idea of going in and getting the raw data, that's the important part. We need the raw data, which is what I did with Dennis Rader and what I'll continue to do with other offenders is let them talk, let them speak, let their world 
present itself as it is and not as we come at it. And for example, in terms of, of preconceptions, after the the book came out with Raider, I mean, it was apparent he had no head injuries. He had no abuse in his background. Wow. You know, his parents were both alive. They stayed together. He had both sets of grandparents. He was an all-American boy. And someone said to me, a psychologist said to me, well, you just didn't get all the background because obviously he had to have been abused in right. some manner. Like, all right, that's, that's a formula idea. And it's not obvious. He shows us our formulas don't work. That's what you have to stay open to. And unfortunately, those formulas are based on those small, unrepresentative samples. And, we, and we've been applying those to the notion of what a serial killer is. And someone like Raider shows us, no, we have to stay open. There's still more to learn. And we have to do that or we're making ourselves even more vulnerable. We think we get this idea that formulas protect us. But if we get stuck in a formula that isn't accurate, it doesn't protect us. It makes yeah. us more vulnerable. Well, sure. I mean, that makes sense. I can We can kind of apply that to most things in life. We just love to have things that are in our control, things that we can define and observe. Yeah. And, and when it strays outside that, that formula, like you're saying, it, it it sends us into a spiral. It does, because it, we think we know, we think we have, we can predict, and then we find out not so much. Yeah. So with, I mean, with your work with Raider, with other work you've done with other serial killers, was there ever any sort of consistencies in terms of, um, you know, their upbringing, any, any sort of those uh, external factors that you found were connecting to some of these others? Well, um, one thing about another misconception is that serial killer is a criminal type mm. and it, it's only a description of a behavior. At least two victims by the same offender or offenders in two, on two separate occasions. That's it. So that's what they have in common. Wow. Um, now you can start grouping them in terms of those that per perhaps are sexually compelled versus those that are compelled more by greed um, or you know some other motivation. Rage is another one. Mission is another one. There's a number of different, a uh, whole spectrum of motivations. But even within those, um, if, like let's say a mission killer, if they're psychotic, they're going to have a whole different way of going about what they do versus somebody who's who's a, who's terroristic or or has a religious mission for example so uh or sexually compelled killers some some are driven by lust and the idea of murder others just murder be, to eliminate a witness to the torture or rape that they just performed so it's you know there's a lot of diversity in the serial killer population we have over 5,000 documented. Um, uh, most people don't realize that because all the documentaries are always on the same dozen or so right. <laughs> over and over Ted and over. Bundy. John Wayne Gacy, <laughs> Jeffrey Dahmer, Ted Bundy, they're always on the same people. Yeah. So we, we tend to think it's this really small, um, select group of individuals. But I mean, we have them all over the world in all different time eras. And in terms of what's common, it's, you know, the definition is basically what's common to them. Hmm. Um, you can study subgroups, like I have a whole book on healthcare serial killers, the, the ones who are in the hospitals, but then you have, ner you have female nurses, you have male nurses, you have uh, other types of medical, like respiratory um, assistants, you have doctors, female and male, you, you know, so you have even within healthcare serial killers, which is kind of homogenous because they're, they're very limited um, MO, basically, but you still have a lot of different motivations uh, and, and different types of personalities and different reasons, and some are mentally ill and others aren't. So, you know, it's a, it's a wide ranging kind of study. Yeah. And when I teach it, it's taught K 
case, very case specific. That's why I like teaching psychology versus criminology or sociology. Mm-hmm. I don't like trend analysis. It doesn't tell us enough. Yeah. I like the details of the cases and the developmental trajectory of a given person's life story because then I'm not making um, you know, generalizations about them. I saw one of the, the BTK um, investigators, he, he goes around giving presentations about the investigation, and he made the statement, all serial killers have some kind of extreme abuse in their backgrounds. Like, okay, ah, no, that's they a don't. cop who, di- who hasn't taken the time to learn the details of the cases, or even his own case. Because he didn't read my book, I had one officer come and tell me, I didn't make him, I didn't make him tell me the truth. And I said, Well, I'm looking at all the behavior, including the lies. But that's really your job. And also, it's clear you didn't read the book. So how do you know if I didn't, what I did or didn't do with the guy? Right. You know. So these are the kinds of responses I get. They're they're often superficial. Um, out, you know, driven by formula, by the idea that whatever we've we believe we've known in the past is the way it'll always stay, mm-hmm. and it's we have to stay open. We have to mm-hmm. stay open, and that's really a difficult thing, I think, for many people to do. Yeah. How did you know? Something that just came up for me is like, how did you keep those boundaries? How did you take care of yourself when you were working with? these very extreme offenders and and how did you separate work from work and home from home and um and and that sort of thing and that's a good question because i have other colleagues who allowed the offender to run all over them call them in the middle of the night run up their phone bills wow um, call them at all, at all the time uh to the ex- at the expense of their family life and and some even went into debt and some got almost mentally ill over it because they just they couldn't get the guy out of their heads or or woman and um, i was very clear on my boundaries and i always am very clear on my boundaries and the nice thing about prison calls is you have to accept right (laughs) you know they they don't just get to break into your your you know, whatever you're doing, you look at your phone and no, nope, not taking that call today. Mm-hmm. So you, in fact, I'm the one who has control over that. Um, I can decide to open their letters or not. I can decide to take their calls or not. So you can set boundaries and you have to set boundaries. You have to be very serious about those boundaries because if the offender you're studying it has borderline personality disorder, for example, or or psychopathy, you know, they're going to be manipulative and right. they're going to try to try to get beyond those boundaries and to break through those boundaries and to ignore those boundaries. And you have to make sure they respect you. And at the point at which it's clear they're not respecting you, then it's done, right? You have to be able to let it go. No, mm. we're not going to proceed with this. But the thing is that if you have someone who's very narcissistic, for example, well, they want the attention, right? Right. So it's a little bit easier to set the boundaries because you've got that reward system in place and you use it. That's what you do. You use their reward system to make sure they observe the boundaries that you set up Mm -hmm. and you just make sure when you set them up, it's about respect, but you have to show them some respect too. So it's mutual. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it, just this whole idea of boundaries, it, it brings up this question for me of like, how do you balance, you know, some, something I commonly hear is like, uh, how, you know, when, when we do these serial killer profiles, when we do these big Netflix documentaries, when we do these other shows and books and things like that, that we're giving attention to these killers, we're giving them more of a, a platform to, I don't know, share what they've done, I guess. And, and I feel like that's, that's a common criticism I've heard is like that we're giving them that space. How do you balance the idea of like giving them that space while also being able to do the research, share the story and kind of do what you've been doing? Well, that was one of the main 
topics of discussion among our production crew. Um, w- one of our partners in all this was Dick Wolf and his and his team. And uh, the person that we worked with said exactly that. How are we keeping from just giving this guy a platform? Because that is not something I want to do. Well, it's the same reason I did the book. If there wasn't something to learn of value, then there was no point in letting this guy just talk about himself. I've seen books where serial killers, it's just you're their secretary recording whatever they want to say and you put it out there and get it published. I didn't need to add to that. There's plenty of those. I wanted, it's, it, what I did was called a guided autobiography. I guided him toward um, working in a way that would benefit criminology, psychology, and law enforcement. So that was what we kept always as our guiding principle. We're letting him talk, we're giving him this forum, but we're extracting the lessons from it. So it's not just a a titillating audience grabber. It's about, what can we learn from this story? Mm -hmm. And, And truthfully, that's the only of these extreme offenders. Those are the only ones I'll work with. I'll work with the ones that I think we can learn something from who are, have some degree of self-awareness and who do want to at least attempt to help in some way, gain some insight into who they are as a way to uh, think more about treatment and intervention and prevention. So if, there, if those kinds of things are not evident in a person's story, I don't have any interest in working with them. I've had opportunities mm-hmm. to work with some who I just said, no, they're too, they're vulgar, they're demanding, they're manipulative, and I don't see anything coming out of this except a true crime book of some kind. I don't do those. Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't, not, not that I'm not dismissing all true crime books, because certainly I use them in my, in, in my research, mm-hmm. but I, I don't want to add yet more just killers talking i want to structure it and use it in a way i think is beneficial and raider wanted to do that too so that's why i i agreed to come in and take over the project the same thing with any other of of these offenders that i talk to if if that's not of interest to them or if they say it is but it's pretty clear it's not, then, I, you know, I'm not going there. That's right. not what I do. Right. Well, you know, I think that's just something that makes you stand out as, as a professional is that you're not just trying to add to the entertainment aspect that comes with this whole uh, subfield, um, which kind of leads me to my next topic. Like, yeah, what? I'm, I'm not really... Yeah. I was going to say, I'm not really a, what would be called a true crime journalist, and they have a different goal. Um, you know, and more power to them because they're doing something very different from what I'm doing. Um, so I, I always keep my particular goals in mind when I, when I decide on a subject area. Yeah. Well, and, and you may have already answered it then, but my, my next question was what, what do you think of just the mass amount of serial killer, you know, uh, media, I guess, whether it be movies, TV shows, documentaries, books, I mean, it just seems like it's coming in mass now. I feel like every time I open up Netflix or something like that, there's there's something new. Um, how is that affecting your field? How do you Thank feel Thank like God. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I like to watch. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, I If it's well done, uh, it adds a lot, I think. Um, like, for example, the one HBO did called The Investigation, which was the murder of Kim uh, Wall. In, mm. in Sweden, I think, um, and it was so we- so meticulous. Probably some people would have thought it was really slow because it, it, they really were stuck so many times. But it was so meticulous on the forensics that I learned a lot, and I was enthralled with it. I don't really care for the the more co- cozy kinds of true crime presentations they you know, I, I personally don't watch them um, I do think media 
always wants a large audience. Mm -hmm. And they hooked into this burgeoning interest in crime that really occurred, you know, back in the 90s. It started with the O.J. Simpson trial um, and grew with CSI and Bones and some of those shows and then expanded into the cold case arena. And now many, many, many people are doing podcasts so the the number of amateur uh, investigators or you know whatever you want to call them who who are out there you know honing in on a specific case and wanting to solve it and some have done really remarkable jobs so you know i i love it if a, a show is well done and takes us deeply into some crime or incident of crimes um And I think what people really like is the puzzle, the mystery, Mm. watching how it unfolds, trying to figure it out. Um, It's compelling. It's it's not just the titillation of the graphic nature of a crime. It's really uh, about how did an offender even think like that? How do they do that? Why do they do that? Um, And how do the investigators solve it? I mean, there's one um, called Catching Killers, mm-hmm. which I think is now in its second, has just completed its second season. It's fascinating to listen to the detectives talk about their specific challenges, not just with with the lack of evidence or something, but also with the politics of their department and, um, you know, what they need to do, how they work together, what resources they have or don't have the pressures from the media and the public. I think it's really fascinating to watch the how the investigation unfolds and how th- many of these people are thinking back on them. And some of them, I think, do actually take up a, an interesting cause. Um, mm. There was one, I think, be- believe me, about rape. Um, oh, yeah. That on, was on Netflix, I think. Yeah. You know, I think I remember seeing yeah, that Yeah, I think it, it was. And then there was another similar one called Unbelievable, was, which was oh, okay. also really good. Mm-hmm. And it really woke you up to some of the things that victims faced. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't have any trouble with how many crime shows there are out there. I, I, I think people not looked at it not just as entertainment, but as a learning experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you, where do you see this going in the future? Where do you see this field growing and changing? It's already changing. Yeah. Uh, it kind of goes the way that many scary things go, and it starts getting silly. Hmm. It, you're seeing more silly things coming out of it. Uh, let's make fun of serial killers. Let's make fun of crime investigation um Mm -hmm. and that's that's that usually signals the death of of the genre in its current form because it no longer impacts us the way it did if we can now laugh at it and and make it make light of it Uh, unfortunately i find that that makes light of the victims too and their families which, Mm -hmm. which i don't you know that's not where i'm going with it but I definitely don't like the humor ones. That they're to me that I, I don't even watch them. Um, yeah. The ones that stereotype, the ones that that deal with a, a crime in a superficial manner. Sure. That's that's beginning to show you that they're now really not taking their audience seriously. They're just going for whatever whatever they can get. Um, so. I think I think we're seeing that it's certainly transitioning. What it will transition into, I'm not really sure. I know yeah. I know media is trying to transition it into more interesting con artists and so because you see a lot more of that now in some of these documentaries. Whether yeah. the audience will follow, what I, was I don't the new know one that just came true. out? The the Tinder Tinder swindler. Did you hear about that the one? Tinder the the Tinder swindler. There was that, and then the uh, roommate one, the worst roommate, is about con artists. Oh, really? Okay. One serial killer, Dorothy Puente. Um, but, and there's a number of, oh, and the uh, Anna Delphi one. Um, mm, yeah. 
inventing Anna or whatever that mm-hmm. one was. That was about a, another swindler. So you're beginning to see more of those. And I think because they're running out of the really sensational murder ones. <laughs> so, yeah. so now they're moving into some other uh, area of crime. I'm not sure the audience is going to follow it. Yeah. Interesting. You know, I'm not sure if this exactly falls into the work you do. I'm, I'm guessing it doesn't. But, um, you know, something that, that when I think of this topic hits home for me is the Colorado shooting. I'm from Colorado. I don't know if I had told you that originally. Yeah, but that's a mass murder. Yeah, the mass murder with the Aurora shooting with the uh, the Batman movie, right? Um, right. How how have you seen copycat kill? I don't know if they would if he would be considered a copycat killer in the sense that he's he was copying they, the Joker or whatever. Well, there definitely have been a lot of media inspired murders, and Dexter probably being the most often um, people who want to be Dexter or be really? like Dexter. We've had probably a dozen murders that are Dexter related murders. Um, but there's a lot of movies that have inspired uh, some kind of murder spree or mass murder or school shootings, but they're not really copycats. The copycat mm. murders are about somebody who watches one, how one incident was done and tries to replicate it. That's what a copycat is in my world. Mm-hmm. So being inspired by media is not the same as actually trying to copy mm-hmm. what someone else did. Yeah. But there's certainly what happens in any kind of mass murder or school shooting is you have people thinking, I want to outdo that person. Um, or, or they've been thinking of it and now some, you know, that person took away their thunder essentially. Um, but now they're going to go out and do something similar and get more media attention. They want to be the world's worst mass murderer or something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, that's that's super interesting. I mean, so when it comes to treatment and prevention for these kind of things, what have you found? Like, are there ways for us to, you know, slowly decrease the amount of mass shootings and the amount of serial killers in our society or... Is it kind of, like you said, this kind of sporadic, there isn't a formula? Well, there's no formula, but it also means putting some limits on media, uh, guns, <laughs> things that people aren't going to, you know, want mm. limits on. And, yeah. um, you know, as long as we're giving a lot of attention to a particular person who's a some kind of killer there will be people who aspire to be that person or Mm. aspire to outdo that person. Always there will be. So the more media coverage, uh, especially sensational coverage, the more you're affecting what we would call at-risk individuals, people who are vulnerable, who think about themselves, who immerse themselves. We have a number of wannabe serial killer kids who go out and, you know, they, they watch their their role model, Ted Bundy or the Yorkshire Ripper, Ian Brady, something like that. Now they want to do exactly what that person did. So they'll go out and get their implements and and pick out a victim and start, you know, start their rampage, often caught well before. Like there was one girl um, we heard about about a month ago. I, I write a blog for Psychology Today where I keep track of all these and she decided she's going out on one date each night and she'd kill all of them because she wanted to be the night stalker Richard Ramirez or wow. she thought Jack the Ripper was actually a female so that's who she wanted to be and you know so we have to be very alert to people who get that immersed into it so yeah we have we definitely have been able to identify certain red flags like callous unemotional behavior cruelty to ch- other children or animals, not the not the McDonald triad. That's you know, there's no research support for right. the fire setting, bedwetting part of it. But um, we have to watch children who don't seem to have empathy, um, pro-social connection to others, sense of of moral commitment, behavior, and then add to that immersion into mass murder like adam lanza he knew every mass murder in, in the entire world and he had a whole chart wow. around his room of all these mass murders and that's what he wanted to be 
So no surprise that he went into the elementary school and started shooting. That's all he could think about, that he identified himself as a future mass murderer. So we have to watch what kids are doing in terms of of their uh, media appreciation, what they're watching, how excited they get about a certain type of, of offender. Um, that That is the other part of the equation that we need to be very attuned to because that's they're forming their sense of identity. And if it hooks into, I want to be the Yorkshire Ripper, <laughs> then... Okay, that's not healthy, and right. yeah, we have to we have to start thinking about that. And that's going to be in part is going to be about role models around them too. You know, you have you have parents immersed in true crime shows. What do you think? The kids are going to be paying attention to that. Yeah. So we we definitely see in these cases a, a deep fascination with specific types of offenders mm. in in their background. And so if you add in some of those personality issues like callousness, you, you know, you have a formula and we're and we're watching how that operates. Then what's the treatment? That's the next question. I'm not a therapist. I'm I'm not a school counselor. I'm not in that arena. But I do know that we have some programs um that are treating at-risk adolescents to try to prevent them from being violent or being violent again if they've already committed some kind of violence. And that some of those programs are very effective. They're a form of cognitive behavioral therapy mm-hmm. with a lot of accountability, and they, ha- they are being effective. You can't make someone become pro-social if they just aren't, they don't feel very strongly if you can't can't generate that but you can generate some uh, reasoning for them as to why accountability will work in their favor yeah well i mean this has been just super fascinating i i'm curious you know working with these really intense cases where there's a lot of death there's a lot of um just sadness and grief and trauma um or, or sometimes not trauma uh how? Where do you find hope in all of this? Where Where are you able to see hope in some of the work that you do? Um, I don't, I guess I don't really think like that as mm. much. Um, I think I think it's too broad of a question to know how to answer. Because yeah. hope can be in many different areas of my life without being caught up in that. You can, I mean, I, I'm a professor, so the hope in the future generation of students who are inspired by what I'm doing in the classroom, who th- who might then go on to, you know, create a treatment that no one's thought about yet. Right. So I think that area of what I do, and I do, obviously, that's my full-time job. So sure. Sure. A lot of my time is spent on um, forming students into people who will want to uh, do, you know, what's good for society. Some of them want to study serial killers, of course, because that's that's part of the appeal. But if they do, then um, hopefully they'll see the need for treatment that maybe they'll invent some things that we don't yet know how to do. I, I think that would be what, where the hope is. I mean, I don't, mm. I don't foresee that the offenders I, I do this work with are, are going to change. I don't think mm. like that unless they're yeah. very self-aware and really motivated to change. I don't, I don't see the hope in that. But if, you know, if one of them was, then there's hope there. Mm. But most, most of the hope, I think, in my work has more to do with the students and the people yeah. who are learning from me. Yeah, no, I think that's great. I mean, that's such a, this seems like such a nice balance and maybe, maybe you could speak a little bit more of this, but it seems like such a nice balance where you're, you said it's your full-time job is being a professor. Um, and that's where you're able to find hope. That's where you find, um, maybe a sense of joy. I don't know. Uh, but then balancing that with doing the hard work that not only very few people can do in terms of working with these serial killers and these really extreme offenders. Yeah, and I think I think there are a few who can, and those of us who can, 
should. Right. Um, but joy, I find joy in my work. I find joy yeah. in writing. I love writing. Yeah. I'm writing novels. I mean, that's that's different. I saw from, that. Yeah. You know, working. And I and I think too. I'm not all like it's not a hundred percent of my time is on these extreme offenders. I'm I do a lot of other things. And mm-hmm. uh, yeah, I have a, a show called Murder House Flip where we go in and and heal homes where murders have happened to make homeowners like their place much better and not yeah. be so creeped out by it. Um, that's that was a interesting kind of project to work on. But the novels. I mean, I'm I'm enjoying that. That's a forensic psychologist who runs a an investigation agency, and I'm loving it. I'm having yeah. a great time with it. Oh, that sounds like so much fun. I know a, a handful of your books are on my to to to, uh, to read list right now, so I'll be making great. sure to make some time to check that out. So, and I'll make sure to link your books in in my podcast and all that. So, okay, great, awesome. Well, hey, um, I always like to leave it open at the very end. If you have any last thoughts, any last kind of tidbit of wisdom that you'd like to share with my listeners. (laughs) Um, I I think the one thing that maybe has disturbed me um, the most about how much our, our culture has become very true crime oriented is that victims get overlooked or Mm. made light of or even joked about yeah and we're losing sight of the seriousness of what family families of victims go through Mm -hmm. one of the things like the the btk book i did um a large percentage of goes to the families Oh wow! What yeah. I make on it, um, and I did spend time with some of them. Their pain, which is never going to heal, gets overlooked quite often mm. when when we make light of it. So, you know, there's a lot of memes and jokes that go around about. Oh, I've had such a stressful day. I think I'm going to watch a serial killer marathon. Like that's not funny. Mm. Right? That's not, yeah. that's not funny because that means the number of people died. Yeah. And and that's the one thing I think I have a, I have a hard time with is I, I don't want to lose sight of just how serious yeah. these what what these offenders have done is. Yeah. And they don't lose sight of it, certainly. Yeah, they might they might distance themselves with words like you know, that's my project or, you know, mm-hmm. dehumanizing people. But, um, yeah, I guess that's, that's what I'd want to say. Yeah. I, don't, I, th- I don't think it's cool. Mm. I don't think they're cool. And I get a number of people who, who do think, oh, it's so cool. Yeah. You know, you talk to Dennis Rader, how cool is that? Like, <laughs> Oh, uh, he could have done so much more interesting things with his life. He didn't. Sure. He ruined his family. He ruined mm. other families. And he sits in prison for the rest of his life. Yeah. That's not, not cool. Interesting. Not cool. Yeah. Well said. Thank right. you. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Ramsland. I, I really appreciate your time and, and just taking some time to share a little bit about your life and your work. And um, yeah, thank you so much. Well, thanks for reaching out to me. I appreciate your questions. Of course.